and to uh, welcome you all to this uh, lecture and discussion. Uh, my name is Dustin Bird, uh, I'm Assistant Professor of Humanities here. I see that uh, some of you who have been in my class, so you certainly know who I am, and you know that I often talk a lot about uh, Dr. Rudolf Siebert here. So uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming out and thank the uh, Humanities Department for uh, sponsoring this event and ITS for working hard and making sure that technical folks like me uh, can, can run these things and also the faculty and staff that have came out that I appreciate it a lot. Um, I'd like to let you know that on April 19th, we're gonna be showing a film called Only a God Can Save Us, and it's about uh, Martin Heidegger, who was a famous German philosopher, uh, and also a member of the Nazi party. Uh, an American filmmaker named Jeffrey Van Davis has made a film about him. He lives in Germany, but he's right now touring the country, and he's been all up and down the East Coast at the Ivy League schools, he will be in the University of Chicago this uh, coming month, and he is coming to Olivet to uh, show his film on uh, April 19th at 4.30 in this room, and we'll have discussion with him about filmmaking as well as uh, about uh, Nazism, about philosophy, and the role of uh, intellectuals in political movements. So that's uh, April 19th, if you're interested in that. Now, on to the, the master here. Uh, this is Professor uh, Rudolf J. Siebert. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him real quick. He took his Abitur in the Humanistic Lessing Gymnasium in Frankfurt, Germany, uh, 1946. In 1948, he earned a BA in philosophy from the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, Germany. Uh, Professor Siebert earned an MA in theology at the Johannes Gutenberg University. And in 1953, uh, and an MSW from the Catholic University uh, that's a Master of Social Work from the Catholic University in uh, uh, University of America, Washington, D.C. in 55. 1957, Professor Sieber earned uh, a, a Stats, uh, the Stats Examen in uh, History, Theology, Philology, and Philosophy from the Johannes Gutenberg University as well. Finally, in 1965, he earned his uh, Doctorate in Theology from the Johannes Gutenberg uh, University. I met, uh, personally met Dr. Siebert in 1994 when I was an undergrad at Western Michigan University. Uh, in the meantime, he's become my friend, my mentor, and in many ways my doctor father. He is uh, the one I'm working with on my PhD at the moment. Um, he has 17 books to his credit. Uh, many are up to their fourth edition, uh, but he just recently published a three-volume work called Manifesto of the Critical Theory of Society and Religion. And when I reminded him that a manifesto is generally a short pamphlet, and he wrote three volumes, uh, he told me that we're modern people now and we have much more to say. So he has nearly 300 articles to his uh, credit and chapters in other books. Uh, he, gives, he has given hundreds upon hundreds of lectures uh, internationally and is the director of two international conferences, one in Dubrovnik, Croatia, and the other in Yalta, Ukraine. In 1965, he took up a position at Western Michigan University, Department of Comparative Religion, and he lived there in Kalamazoo, and lives there in Kalamazoo where he raised uh, his eight children. Uh, it's my pleasure, uh, on behalf of the uh, Humanities Department and Olivet College, to introduce you to my friend and mentor, Dr. Ralph Siebert. Uh, thank you very much for your invitation. And uh, I'm very happy to be here. I have been here before, and it was a wonderful experience. So I'm glad to be invited again. And I'm supposed to say something today on the life under Hitler, suffering, memory, and critical theory. And you saw, of course, some of it already in this little uh, movie there. Um, it is, of course, not easy to remember um, these things which happened at that time and uh, sometimes we have a hard time to remember what we ate last Sunday not to speak of what happened 50 or 60 years ago and um, of course we should not simply remember for remembrance sake but because we are in a situation and we are in a crisis three wars now and a financial crisis and um, if we cannot remember then we may have to suffer through the same things. And therefore, I think it is very important to remember what is behind us, um, the issue how liberalism can suddenly turn into fascism, or how liberalism can turn into socialism, and then fascism in order to stop socialism, 
and to bring everything back to civil society again. So there are connections between that experience and what we are experiencing today, and then of course also into the future. I do with my students every day time diagnosis where we take events of the day and we analyze them and then we have a prognosis where we try to look forward what will become of this. Now I had the first contact with politics already very early. When I was a little fellow I lived on the west side of Frankfurt. It was the proletarian section of Frankfurt. Um, on the other side there was a bourgeois section and the so-called critical theorists of whom you heard there, uh, Adorno for instance and Fromm, they lived on the west side, they lived in the bourgeois section and I grew up in the proletarian section and the Institute for Social Research which they have founded at Frankfurt and then uh, took it to New York was only 10 minutes away from my home where I grew up. But one experience I had there which happened every week, every Saturday there came people from the left, these were the communists. They had a red flag and hammer and sickle and they came and they sang their songs and from the other side there came the fascists, the National Socialists or the SA, the brown shirts. And they met right under my window and then they began to beat each other up. And I waited all week long for this because that was a moment of excitement which broke somehow into the boredom of my little existence at that time. And then a few minutes later came the police and they came in right into the middle on horses and they beat on the SA men and they beat on the communists and finally after two hours of struggle there were all kinds of proud shirts and all kinds of communists laying on the street. They cleaned it up and then next Saturday the whole thing was repeated again. So um, that was my first contact with National Socialism, with Fascism, and then also with, um, with Communism and Socialism. And I still grew up under a liberal system. The so-called Weimar Republic was uh, a liberal system which had been established uh, according to the model of the United States to a large extent. So, of course, I was a little fellow. My father and my mother worked in a shoe factory which belonged to a Jew. And uh, the Jew uh, owner had to flee, he went to London and it was taken then over by the National Socialists. So there was at that time liberalism very fast changing over into fascism. It took practically only a few months, of course it was prepared somehow. So instead of having a dualistic system where you have a state and then civil society and that state may be stronger or weaker in order to tame or to regulate civil society and then suddenly the fascists uh, introduced another system namely movement, party and state. These three partite divisions suddenly came up. Uh, it was new but it was introduced very very fast. So uh, there was particularly one famous man, Carl Schmidt, who is also very famous again for us today. Our libraries have all his books. Um, Carl Schmidt was originally a um, theologian and a jurist, uh, one of the greatest jurists which Europe had, but at the same time also a national socialist. And therefore I want to warn you that when we sometimes make caricatures out of these movements, that of course the fascist movement, like the liberal movement or the socialistic movement, that these can become tremendously uh, powerful um, entities and that one must not take them lightly. There is a word fascism today, as there is a word liberalism and a word socialism. And uh, unfortunately, the fascist movement has not stopped with Hitler's death. Um, they may look at him critically today and may say he made some mistakes, but the movement, the philosophy, a philosophy of life, uh, continues today with great strength and sometimes it has even the component of anti-Semitism. There's an, a growing anti-Semitism in Germany and France and also here. Of course it is somewhat different because at that time there was no State of Israel, which is a new component of course in the fascist movement today. So uh, this was the experience which I had before 
1933, Hitler visited the um, city uh, early in his regime, uh, and my parents took me there, and there were tremendously enthusiastic crowds. And later on, they all said they did not love Hitler, but they did love Hitler. Masses of people did. So, I uh, uh, grew up in this transition between a liberal state and uh, then suddenly a fascist state. And um, uh, I saw Hitler the first time there, and I saw him the last time in the Taunus Mountains in December 1944, when he guided the Ardennes Offensive, which cost the lives of 150,000 American soldiers, where Hitler tried once more to apply the Schlieffen Plan and to cut the Allies into two and find release in the West so that he could continue his fight in the East, where he had been beaten in Stalingrad, in Sharkov, and, and in Berlin. So, the other influences which I had in this new state now was that I was a member of the Catholic uh, youth movement, and um, of course um, Catholicism was one uh, religion in Germany, the other one was Lutheranism, the other was Calvinism, and then uh, union between Lutheranism and Reformed people. So I grew up in this Roman Catholic movement, and of course, what I was not aware of this um, was that at this time, 1933, there was an alliance established between the Vatican and uh, the uh, Hitler's government in Berlin, a concordat was concluded, and this concordat secured the youth movement. That means the Catholic youth movement could continue to exist, and it did throughout the war, as well as Hitler paying church taxes to the last day of his life in April 1945. So the um, so-called concordat uh, before that, we had Mussolini's Lateran uh, Treaty with the Vatican, and then we had a concordat with Salazar in Portugal, with Franco in Spain, and, um, so, and uh, with people in Hungary. So all the fascist states uh, had a concordat with Hitler, but no social, the only socialistic state did not have a concordat. So that means I came into a church which was not entirely hostile to fascism, but partially was willing to cooperate. There were theologians for Hitler uh, in the Roman Catholic Church and in the Protestant Church as well. I did my doctorate even, or started with a professor who had been a Catholic theologian and had uh, supported fascism. This was probably one of the most tragic moral catastrophes which have happened in Christianity. And uh, it happened because the church um, had this idea that when the kings were falling, that means with the French Revolution, that then there would be two types of dictators. One dictators would come from heaven, and they would be bourgeois dictators, like later on Hitler and Mussolini and Franco and so on. And then there would be dictators who would come from hell, and that would be socialist dictators like Lenin and Stalin. And uh, so the church, out of fear of socialism, thought that fascism was the right way. Uh, my pastor, who turned against fascism, still thought that Hitler's attack against Russia, he marched with three million men into the Russian territory. And these three billion men came from all the states which constitute today the uh, European Union. So it was a massive type of a thing, and that's what they hoped from him. They hoped that he would put the socialists or the communists into concentration camps. And the liberals who were there also were somehow for this action, because one thing liberals and fascists have in common, and that is their hate against socialism. So, um, therefore, the bishops um, had this fear and this hope that, uh, the fear of communism and the hope that Hitler would uh, break that threat. And uh, beyond that, they hoped that Hitler would free or clean up the German soul 
and that was all sexual in a certain sense. That means uh, Hitler forbid men and women to bathe together. He um, forbid nudist camps which were promoted by socialists. Um, later on, when I uh, taught in communist territories, there were these beautiful uh, nudist beaches along the Baltic Sea, and um, I thought that they had developed a rather nice culture. But um, as far as the fascists were concerned, that was a horrible thing. And um, then also, of course, porno was forbidden, and the homosexuals were put into concentration camps. And uh, so that was the purification of the German soul, which fascinated um, the, the church. And so the bishop visited Hitler, and they thought he was a very good fellow. They forgot completely that the concentration camps had started already, and um, that in these concentration camps, people were not yet killed, but they were humiliated. These camps were work camps, and they were connected to corporations. You cannot speak about um, um, Auschwitz without talking about capitalism. But they even got a slight, like, little salary in the uh, concentration camps. They were forms of uh, acquiring cheap labor. And um, so uh, the, uh, um, the bishops were not worried about all this. And that is worrisome that they were not worried about them, this, but that they were particularly concerned with the purification of the soul. Man consists of soul and body. Um, and then, of course, when um, they became death camps, uh, then uh, the bishops were, came too late and they could not turn around anymore. And only one bishop in Germany, or maybe two, were able to assist fascism. So um, the uh, whole issue, uh, when they turned into death camps, happened when the following thing uh, occurred. Hitler gave about four or five speeches in which he said, if the Jewish high finance, which would be the Rothschilds, who came from Frankfurt and are in Paris today, if the Jewish high finance will once more lead the Aryan nation into a brotherly or anti-brotherly war, then that will not be the end of Europe, it will be the end of the Jewish race. And uh, so this moment came when Pearl Harbor happened. When Pearl Harbor happened, the European war became an international war, and that was the signal for Heydrich and others to uh, start the final solution. Um, there is something which we as Americans uh, may not understand, right? In Pearl Harbor, after Pearl Harbor, which we consider um, a war, an attack by the Japanese, as a matter of fact, uh, we then started the last legitimate war because President Roosevelt went before Congress and said that the Empire of Japan had launched an heinous attack against the United States and that he asked the Congress of the United States to declare war against the Empire of Japan. That was the last time that the President asked the Congress, as the Constitution of Philadelphia requires, in order to enter a war. All the others are somehow questionable. If you follow the seven-point just war theory by Augustine, then the first point is that only the legitimate authority can declare war, and the legitimate authority is not the executive, but the legislative branch of government. But at that time, there was something else going on. If a country turns capitalistic, it needs cheaper and cheaper labor and cheaper and cheaper resources. Otherwise, you have a falling profit rate, and the falling profit rate is the death knell of the capitalistic system. So, therefore, the Japanese, when they became capitalistic from the late 19th century on and opened their harbors, they needed cheaper and cheaper labor, but the island, of course, is very small. And therefore, they had to go beyond the island, and they marched into China, and they also expanded into the Pacific. As they moved into the Pacific, they of course crashed into interest sphere of the United States. That means when you have a capitalistic country, you need cheaper labor and you have to colonize. The colonies are bound together to empires, and the empires crash together in competition for the cheaper labor and the cheaper resources. 
be in Africa or the in India or in uh, the Near East or wherever. So, nevertheless, the Tokyo, uh, Berlin, and uh, 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 all axis uh, thought that Jap Japan had been attacked. That means Japan had been encircled by the United States and had no other way out than to attack in Pearl Harbor and sink the fleet. And um, so, therefore, they were obligated to support Tokyo and they declared war on the United States. At that moment, the war had become an international war again. According to Hitler's philosophy and theory, uh, the Jews were responsible for this. But the Jews which came into the concentration camps were not the high finance. The high finance as well as the industrial Jews had long left to London and to New York. So what went into the camps were working class Jews and low middle class Jews. He had the wrong people in a certain sense. So this was the atmosphere in which I grew up, which did not mean that I was fully aware of all these things, of course not. But um, later on, as I learned to reflect on it, it became clear to me. As a little fellow, I was got into the tension field of different uh, forces. So um, I had, when I was uh, 10 years old, it was a law of the state that one had to go into um, the Hitler Youth. So I was a member of the Hitler Youth. Um, the uh, present Pope, Benedict XVI, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, he says he never went to the youth uh, service there. He, he stayed at home, which was not possible. It was a state law. You had to go there every Wednesday or every Saturday and so on. But then I was also, uh, when I was already six years old, a member of the Catholic Church. And what they told me in the Catholic youth movement was very different from that what they told me in the Hitler youth. And it is for me still a riddle why the influence or the conditioning or the socialization in the Catholic youth movement was so much more powerful than what the fascists did, who very often imitated the church in, in many ways, particularly Hitler. Hitler was Roman Catholic, Goebbels was Catholic, and also Himmler was Catholic, Goebbels was Protestant. So um, they all were members of uh, the main churches uh, in, in Germany, and the three million men who marched into the Soviet Union and killed 27 million Russians, so-called communists, they were all baptized Christians. Half of them were Protestant, the other one was Catholic. Also, of course, the camps, the administration of the camps by some branches of the SS or so. Also, the SS were all baptized Protestants and all baptized Catholics. So, that is why Auschwitz is not only a horrible crisis for the Jews, but also for the Christians as well. So, uh, nevertheless, in the, uh, I was fascinated by this uh, youth movement. Um, when in liberalism the family disintegrates, then we very often do not have youth movements which could take care and of the youth and could replace maybe the family. But the Catholics have this youth movement, the communists have it, and the fascists had it too. And maybe also in liberal countries we should uh, uh, we should think about uh, such movements in order to uh, replace wherever the family has broken down. So my family broke down because of my father's cancer death. So therefore, for me, the Catholic youth movement became um, somehow a home and the young priests who educated us were a strong force in, in our lives at that time. So for one year or two years, the Catholic youth movement functioned well and then uh, trouble started. Hitler did not uh, really conform to his own concordat, which by the way is still valid today. That means the German federal government still holds on to Hitler's concordat, and the priests are paid according to Hitler's concordat, and the church is not very interested to dissolve the concordat. It was a very good one for the church in a certain sense. So nevertheless, my leaders were beaten up some of them were killed. The main youth leader in Germany for the Catholic youth movement was tortured in such a way that we could not even open the coffin during the funeral in Frankfurt in the cathedral. 
But uh, the, uh, that I did not become a part of the fascist movement, which was very attractive, also particularly for youngsters, um, that is due to my education in the Roman Catholic Church. Another influence was that as a little proletarian, I had an uncle who was a judge, and he put me into a humanistic elite gymnasium or high school, and there I had to learn Latin and Greek and Hebrew, and no, uh, well, maybe one modern language, modern languages were no good, and also natural sciences were not good. It was a tremendous concentration on this linguistic type of humanism. And uh, so uh, I was a little po polit token proletarian, uh, so the others were all sons of bourgeois characters, of doctors and professors and, and, uh, and so on, and uh, ministers. And uh, so when they discussed the Nile River, uh, I didn't know where the Nile River was, but they had all been there. And that was quite a difficult situation there for some time. But um, I caught up, and maybe the best thing of this experience of humanism, it didn't come over here, it didn't cross the ocean somehow. Um, but it was a very wonderful experience, and even today I still read the New Testament, for instance, in, in Greek, and. Uh, uh, and uh, so, uh, the, in Hebrew, the, the uh, Hebrew Bible, and um, it is a wonderful world which was opened up. In the middle of this Nazi thing, there was somewhat an island of, not only of Christians, but also of humanists. And uh, so it was a fascinating experience. Some of my teachers, they even believed in the Greek God still. They took vacations in Athens. And uh, I, I don't know, maybe they sacrificed even to Zeus or, or Athena or whatever. I hope not, but it could have gone that far. So, um, uh, nevertheless, uh, one experience may show you what the clashes were when you are in the transition period. And we here are in a transition period, and it confuses our students uh, massively. And sometimes we wish to help them more to their clarification, but sometimes these tensions can even be too big for us. So, one morning I went with my bicycle down to that Lessing. Lessing was a great uh, German enlightener, uh, parallel to the French enlighteners. And uh, so, I, uh, my bicycle did not function. The <coughs> chains went off, and so I had to push it down toward the school. And uh, as I looked ahead of me, I walked down there, I saw an old lady with a black coat on. And she had two big suitcases. And she carried them a few steps and then she put them down again and she had to catch her breath. I made some kind of a connection. I thought maybe I could put her suitcases on my bike and then we could roll down together. Well, when I came to her and turned around, she had a huge Star of David on the left side of her coat. And that was a signal that I was not to talk to her, that she could not talk to me according to the Nuremberg Laws, which had been established in Berlin, but had been announced on a party day in, uh, in Nuremberg. And so it was an awkward situation, but it was the um, Catholic education. now. Catholicism, like Protestantism, does not have a good record in terms of anti-Semitism, unfortunately. But the priests who educated me made it perfectly clear that what happened to the Jews in Germany, um, that this was criminal, that it was an injustice. So I was not somehow under the fascist taboo that I could not talk to this woman. But So I began to talk to her, but she was very shy. She spoke the Frankfurt dialect. She came from the area where Anna Frank had been born. Anna Frank stayed in our area about three years, and then her father took her to Holland, where then later on she was brought to, uh, to camp and died there. Recently I saw a movie about American fascism, and they burned books not too long ago, and one of the books was this diary of Anna Frank, and it reminded me again. So the um, the woman, the lady, finally got some courage and she began, she looked around if somebody would see it and there was nobody there and so we talked to, uh, with each other. 
and she uh, said uh, a policeman had come last night and the policeman told her she should pack as much as she could and then she should go to the air shelter of the Lessing Gymnasium, the Lessing High School, and from there she would be transported to the east into a nice village, and there she could live out her life. She was maybe in her 70s, um, and uh, comfortably far away from the hustle and bustle of uh, big cities, and it was a very peaceful and idyllic picture which the police had given her, and she was on her way. Now, there you can see the whole catastrophe uh, of ethical decisions. I thought that I did something good, like Boy Scouts have to do a good deed in the day, and I thought it was a good deed to put this, these suitcases there on my bike. And then we were rolling down. I, I, she believed what the policeman had told her. I believed what the policeman had told her. But we both knew that there were camps in Eastern Europe and in Germany. And we knew that these were working camps. And we both should have asked ourselves what a woman of 75 or whatever, who could not even carry her suitcases, what she could possibly do in a work camp. But it somehow didn't come to us. It is something fatal about ethical decisions that one knows so horribly little about the context in which they have done, have to be done at a certain moment. There's something much more terrible in this whole situation. Where I met this old lady whose name I did not know and do not know and whom I have never forgotten and I have written a lot about her. There we were standing there talking with each other right beside the IG Farben concern which was the biggest uh, chemical corporation in Germany and in Europe. And um, the, uh, the building then became the headquarter of the American uh, government, military government, and today it is the humanity part of the University of uh, Frankfurt. So a huge type of a complex. Now, what went on in this building at that moment when we stood there, decided somehow the woman's fate there was a Jewish uh, scientist, Fritz Haber. Fritz Haber is the fellow who took stuff, ammoniac, out of the air and was able to increase, to double the food supply of the human species, overthrowing the Malthusian law. And he did this before the First World War. Very often in peacetime, scientists are um, humanists and they are cosmopolitan, and then when a war breaks out and the things become very nationalistic, somehow they change into nationalists. So in 1915, the German Schlieffen Plan, the second uh, application, or the first application, did not work. Uh, the German troops got stuck and they could not enter the Seine Valley, which is the only way you can reach Paris. So then Fritz Haber, who was in the German military, had this glorious idea that if one would use weapons of mass destruction, one could break this, uh, the, uh, the stopping of the troops there, and one could uh, save people, and one could uh, end the war. By the way, when you compare this document with what Truman, how Truman argued for the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he uses the same words, saving men, shortening the war, and so on. So, the, um, what uh, Haber did, he weaponized gas, and in Uppen, in August 1915, he, when the wind was right, he released thousands of canisters, and he killed 4,000 British and French in this attack. He then went home and celebrated his victory. As he was celebrating his victory, his wife, who was also a chemist, took his revolver and shot herself in the backyard, the mother of a daughter of a child, of his child. Um, the reason for that was that um, Haber was a scientist who was thinking positivistically. I'm sorry that I have to use some of these, these strange words, but there are no others. And his wife was also positivistic oriented. Positivism means some kind of the metaphysics of what is the case. 
you consider only that what is immediately the case to be real and then to mathematize it and you work statistics about it and you analyze it and so on. So um, that is a, a positivistic mind, approaches things like that. But this, his wife also was a dialectician. Dialectical thinking means to think in opposites and how opposites interact with each other. So she could think that when you do something on one side of the front, then of course somebody will do something on the other side of the front and then they will somehow circle themselves up into heaven knows what uh, events. So she had this premonition and she could not face it. So, but what she had faced in her mind, that came about. The British invented the gas mask and therefore neutralized uh, uh, the, the Fritz Haber's uh, um, gas. By the way, I just met in Notre Dame on Saturday the son of his assistant, of Fritz Haber's assistant, a German officer who served Fritz Haber, who became a Jewish general in the German army and led the whole gas war for the rest of the war. And um, so, and, Fritz, and my friend Gregory Baum from Canada is now looking up all kinds of biographies in order to find something about his father who died in the first year of his life. And um, the, um, the wife, his wife, Gregory Baum's wife, um, also her father died in the first year of her life. And he was a British soldier who was killed by harbors gas. There you see the family connections of weapons of mass destruction. So the, um, the war went on and uh, then uh, in order to neutralize the gas masks, uh, Fritz Haber invented mustard gas. That is the gas which we gave to Saddam Hussein in order to fight against Iran. That is why we knew that he had weapons of mass destruction. Bush's statement was not entirely untrue. But the mustard gas had already been dissipated before the first Iraq war and was not available at all anymore in the second Iraq war. So nevertheless, uh, the, at the end of the war, two and a half million people had been killed by the gas war because when Fritz Haber increased the mustard gas, the British of course had to find a stronger gas and then Fritz Haber had to find a stronger gas. And so in the end we had these millions of people dead and 10,000 wounded and one of them who was wounded was Hitler. Hitler was gassed by the British and he was blind and he was in the hospital in East Russia when three communists, uh, three Jewish communists or communistic Jews came and told him or the soldiers there there was an armistice that they had lost the war and that if Germany was a republic that the emperor had fled and he would never forget in his whole life the messengers of this message and would take revenge for it. Um, wars usually have two motivations, they are either revenge or they are thievery. Hitler's wars in the West was revenge for Versailles. His war in the East was thievery, colonialism to have colonies up to the Ural. So, nevertheless, the, um, Fritz Haber was then prosecuted by the, um, by the Allies. He was a war criminal. There was no Nuremberg trial yet. So, Fritz Haber let his beard grow and went to Basel and went into hiding. But in 1918 or so, um, he got the news, news from Norway that he had won the Nobel Peace Prize. But not for the gassing, but for the invention which he made before by which he increased the food supply. He went out and he got it. So the father of the gas war also is a Nobel Prize uh, winner. Um, so then the German parliament uh, made him into the hero of the nation. What is for one side of the national line is a hero, is of course a war criminal on the other side. What's a terrorist on one side is a saint on the other side very often the truth stops at the national border. So uh, Fritz Haber now, being a hero of the nation, um, had to do something about insects because the insects had noticed that the food supply had increased. 
And so, therefore, he developed factories all over eastern Germany and produced cyclones. Cyclone A, Cyclone B, Cyclone C, they were all insecticides. Cyclone B was used in order to gas the Jews in Auschwitz and Treblinka and so on. We stood right before that building in which this Cyclone B was produced already in order to be used only several months later. So that is about ethical decisions. I took the lady down to the air shelter. And in the air shelter there were already hundreds of Jews. Frankfurt was a very Jewish city, very liberal city. And uh, so I let her down and took the suitcases down. There came a young SS man came up of the death head, uh, death call uh, uh, groups. The SS consisted of different groups and one of these groups was responsible for concentration camps. A young fellow, they looked very good in their uniforms, black uniforms, and he came up and he looked at me and he looked at this Jewish woman and he could not grasp it. But after he cut, caught his breath, he began to shout and to scream, how can you, as a young Aryan boy, carry the suitcases of a Jewish pig? So I know what I answered. I said, she looks like my grandmother, she does not look like a pig. Now he thought I had a Jewish grandmother. That made things only worse. And he shouted more and more, and the windows were open of this whole wonderful humanistic high school, and so all the classes could listen to this now. He went to my um, the president of the college, Dr. Silomon, who was one of the noble Nazis, who uh, didn't want to do anything bad. He thought, you know, nationalism was a good thing, and he had written a book about the Indo-Germanic uh, tribal uh, language uh, uh, family. And uh, before the racism became biological by English and French scholars and so on, it was a linguistic type of a thing, like Germanic tribesmen from Sweden and Norway went into India, and you have Sanskrit still and so on, so there was a whole a company of languages which all had almost the same word for father, mother, brother, and so on. And so that was turned into biology, and he had written about this. So the SS man asked him, what kind of a school do you have here? You know, what kind of creeps are you educating? And I was this creep whom he was educating. So he looked at me, you know, with great sadness. He didn't say it all. He looked as if, how could you do this to us, and so on. So, it was the last time that I saw this noble Nazi director when I was then in the Air Force and um, in an airport in uh, Mannheim, which was bombed day and night. Um, we were, he came out, the teachers came out to teach us humanism as we were already soldiers and fought against the British and the American air fleets. So whenever we landed, or the fight was over, then we learned Latin again and Greek and, and, and so on. So he had come out there and suddenly there was an attack by the uh, American Air Force. The Americans attacked in daytime and the British at nighttime. And then they put friendly as they were, they put their smoke signs up at the four corners and then they would throw tons and tons of bombs into the middle. So if you were between those four corners, then you knew what would happen to you. So he was laying beside me, he was laying in a hole, and the bombs were falling right and left. And I said, where is Henry Ford now? Because as you know, Henry Ford was a Nazi here in Michigan. He was a good friend of Hitler. He got a decoration by Hitler. They shared the same um, uh, economic philosophy. They were both against speculative capital, that means Wall Street. They were both for productive capital. If they both would live today, they would have given all the monies to the industry and not to Wall Street. Uh, so, and Hitler was very successful with this, and Ford admired him. Hitler was able to give six million Germans work in the year 1934. Uh, if Obama would do that now, that is 10% of the population, we would have 30 million people would get jobs. If somebody does this, people look at him as if he was the messiah, of course. So, um, nevertheless, there was also here in Michigan, of course, a good friend of Ford, and that was Father Coughlin. Father Coughlin was a fascist radio speaker who had millions of people listening to him every Sunday at 3 o'clock. Uh, he came from Kalamazoo, where I'm coming from. In Kalamazoo, you had a lot of fascists and you had a lot of communists in the paper mills. 
who were fighting against each other. So the, the uh, Father Kaflin um, he wrote to Goebbels, he was befriended with Goebbels, the propaganda minister, and told him that if he would stop shouting against, Christ, against Christianity, that the country here was ready for fascism. And so Goebbels went to Hitler and he gave a speech in the Diet and he said, we have to change our propaganda for the United States. We must play down this whole Christian thing, but if we push other things, economic and political, we may go through. And there was the Bund here in Chicago and in New York, and Father Coughlin was the saint of them. So the story, what I remember, is not only something which is strangely over there, but it has reached our coasts here as well. Also, you know that Hitler made an experiment with us. He uh, uh, put uh, hundreds of Jews on the ship. He sent the ship to Havana and he bet that nobody would accept them. And they were not accepted in Havana, which was our, under our control. They were not accepted in any harbor along the East Coast up to New York. They were not accepted in New York. They got coal and uh, food and New York and water. And then they were sent back to Germany. And it was um, a German old captain from the old Marines there from the First World War. And he took the ship to England and crashed it against the rock. And was thereby able to rescue the Jews. But the Jews were put into internment camps in England. And then they were sent to Belgium and Holland. And when Hitler marched into Belgium and Holland, he caught them again. Here we also see a guilt connection among Western nations, which we should reflect upon. So, nevertheless, the, uh, uh, after I asked him, you know, where is Henry Ford? Henry Ford, in the meantime, had built the Liberator here in Dearborn. He had changed, in a few months, he had changed the auto production into, car, into airplane production, and the Liberator um, uh, was his product, and uh, they bombed Mannheim, and uh, I think I shot 18, 16 of them down, and two lightnings or something like this got the decoration for it, and that is another thing which I want to tell you. Um, I, from this school, I was then drafted, and uh, um, the, you have the story there. The um, uh, officer came, uh, at first I got a draft letter, and I didn't go, and so they, um, the officer came, and he said he had, I had no choice, and I had to go. There was no law which would uh, allow conscientious objector status. Uh, also, the Roman Catholic Church had no objectus, conscience objector status. It was introduced only in the, uh, the second, uh, in the Second Vatican Council. So today, a soldier who will be sent to Libya, if we get the boots on the land, there he could then ask himself if this is a just war or an unjust war, according to the seven-point just war theory, and then he could become the conscience objector or not. This possibility did not exist in Germany when um, two farmers uh, refused to serve. They were both uh, shot and uh, the priest was standing by side, side by side and uh, went with them to the execution and they told him that the state was right and that they were wrong. So then I, was, um, I went to Sossenheim in Frankfurt, the airport where I was trained then. Um, and I, as I say in there, I state then, I mean I had to stay anyway, but I also had some consent, I thought, that to rescue the people, when you see ruins of that time in Europe, there were always people under these ruins, and these people were not soldiers, they were women and children and old people, and I thought if I could distract the liberators, then uh, they would throw their bomb bombs in the Taunus Mountains, and then the children would not be killed, or the women, and so on. There was McGovern's campaign manager, you know, McGovern, ages ago. He <laughs> won for office twice. And um, he bombed Frankfurt. And I always said, George, I said, you are very lucky that you are still here. If you have met me over Frankfurt, it would have been your end. <laughs> well, we loved each other and we still do. Uh, and he thinks he's right. But when old people move to Judgment Day, it is very important what they did in their lives. He thinks that his activity was necessary in order to conquer fascism. If that is really true, fascism was beaten in, in Kursk and in Stalingrad, in Charkov and Berlin. It was not overcome by the war, by the air war. As a matter of fact, the more you bomb people, the more loyal they become to their leader, 
the greater are their hopes in their leaders, and so so it is a little bit counterproductive the whole the whole issue. So, nevertheless, I uh, we so we are of different opinion about what we did and what we have to tell in on Judgment Day about our activities. <coughs> nevertheless, I um, so this was my I wanted to finish up this. Uh, um, finished up this story there about the Jewish woman, which shows you the fate of uh, humanism uh, under fascism. When barbarism breaks in, Marx said once, you know, it will either be socialism or it will be barbarism, and in Germany it was barbarism. So um, when I came up into the classrooms, in one classroom there was a priest. Priests were allowed to teach in the schools, and the priest, uh, they read the Hebrew Bible that God had created man according to his image, and down there were the Jews sitting who had produced that document, <coughs> and they were not treated according to God's image. So um, that, um, I went to another classroom, they read Greek, Plato, about the beauty and justice and so on, and down these people were, uh, were sent to the death camps. So this horrible break which can happen, Germans were now a very cultivated nation with their Goethe, their Schiller, and their Beethoven and so on, and people ask all the time, how could that happen? Well, it can happen when liberalism comes into a crisis, when there is an economic crisis, and if there are war crises and so on, then people panic and they want to have a solution, and then they are told that things are dangerous, that they are attacked and so on, and then you just push that button and they will walk, they will think it's a very fateful thing which we should also reflect. So. I came then to the teacher who taught Latin, and we read Obed and so on. He was from the Confessing Church. The Confessing Church resisted fascism in Germany, and he had big glasses. I could never see his eyes, but then I was sitting there, and I looked below his glasses, and he was smiling in his eyes. And uh, from that time, I, as a little token proletarian, had a very good time. Uh, so I must say to the honor of my school, I was never punished for having um, helped the Jewish woman there taking her the, the, the suitcases. So, but then, you know, after being drafted, I fought as long as there were German airplanes, and when they didn't function anymore, I became a lieutenant in the infantry, and I was supposed to go to Russia to fight atheistic Bolshevism, and um, so that uh, um, didn't come about because uh, uh, the uh, Patton, General Patton, uh, marched from Worms uh, into, um, into toward Berlin, and uh, he was supposed to be stopped. And so, for several weeks, I fought against uh, General Patton and his Canadian colleagues. Um, and um, these were uh, very beastly struggles. But I had an experience which gained actuality recently again when we had uh, discussions about the uh, uh, the uh, conventions. Um, the, uh, as far as the torture and so on is concerned, my experience was always that uh, um, that both sides, except the air war, um, but even inside of the air war, that the Geneva Conventions were held. I took a, a city from from Alsenau, from Patton, and he had to remove very fast, and he could not take his hospital along. When I took over the hospital, I found out that he had treated the German prisoners as he had treated his own people. They got the same medicine, they had the same doctors and so on. And when we took over, then of course the Americans were now prisoners and the Germans were free, but they were both still sick and wounded and they got the same treatment. And I think that it is an unbelievable accomplishment that in the middle of hostilities, which become more and more cruel, that a little bit of peace can be, pre can be preserved in the middle of the war. Also, when I finally, in the Battle of uh, Hahnenkamp, you can look it up in the history books, um, I was beaten and all my men were killed, and then I surrendered, and also that happened according to the Geneva Convention. Um, and let me say something about this battle, because it throws light on the whole situation as well. The, it was um, a Sunday afternoon, and the Hungarians, who were fascists too, there was a Hungarian officer company, they surrendered in the morning and went over to Patton and without telling anybody, 
Then Patton drove with 80 tanks into our flank. And not only could the tanks not follow, but Americans usually fought from 8 o'clock in the morning to 5, and 5 o'clock they stopped, and therefore there wouldn't be any attack anymore after 5 o'clock. So there were two people, two of my soldiers, who were dying, and they wanted to have a priest. And where do you get a priest from? In the middle of the battlefield. So since Americans did not fight after 5, I went to the next village and getting to, uh, getting them a priest. I found an old little priest and he, I took him to them and he gave them the last sacrament and they died during the night. And then I wanted to bring him back again because it was dark and I thought he would fall over all kinds of uh, roots or whatever. And so I didn't take my weapons along, all of them. And when we crossed the high, a little road, country how road, suddenly the SS came. That was again when I met the SS again. Um, they were always uh, furious when, when, when this encounter took place. So they came into a little motorcycle and it was a flying court procedure. Um, and there were people hanging already, old men and little boys were hanging there uh, on the trees in the moonshine. And so they came out and they asked me where my weapons were. And I said, well, the weapons are over there with the soldiers. And so they thought I was a deserter. Um, all the Europeans, we, we could, uh, we did not uh, shoot too many deserters, but the Europeans did it massively. When you go forward, you have a chance to survive. If you go backward, you are dead for sure. So they prepared already the documents, the paperwork, as they say, <coughs> for my shooting or hanging, and uh, there my general came suddenly out of the bushes in the middle of the night with a horrible Bavarian dialect, <laughs> and he uh, said, what are you doing there? and he pulled the steel helmet over my face, it disappeared, and he said, look at this, this guy is not worth a bullet. We don't have any bullets anymore, and we don't have any soldiers anymore, so just leave him to me. So that is how it was rescued, otherwise that would have been the last hour. So uh, just one more story about this whole uh, attempt, you know, to overcome fascism. Fascism could have been overcome if the German workers had arisen, and they had fought against Hitler, who was an employee of, not only of uh, Ford, who paid him massive money and gave him a Mercedes when he came out of prison, but also the master club of Düsseldorf. Group Thyssen, when you look in the elevators, you probably have group sometimes, or Thyssen or whatever. They were the people who paid Hitler. So, uh, <coughs> this, uh, so the workers did not rise, and therefore it needed a whole world war in order to come, overcome fascism at that time. And we should remember this when we go into our future, how costly that was. So my last contact with the, the battle was the following thing, and there you see the nihilism of war, which our great Paul Tillich, the theologian, uh, discovered after two wars. So I, uh, we celebrated, we celebrated the birthday of the daughter of an innkeeper in the valley in which uh, uh, Patton was proceeding with his tanks. So as he was moving through the, to the valley, there was an inn. And in this inn we celebrated, in the middle of the war, we celebrated the 18th birthday of the innkeeper. And Crozet and Chapain and so on. Suddenly the first bullets came through the window. And the general said, uh, the Americans are coming. We want to show them a last time what German strategy is. So he took 400 men which were left and he led them around a mountain and then came back to the same road on which the Americans were approaching. The Americans came to the inn, they took flamethrowers and fried the soldiers in the bunker who were sitting there like little chickens. Then he marched up to that village. It was close to five o'clock. The soldiers wanted just to go to the next village and then rest there, put the cannon on automatic, and they would shoot all night long, move a little bit, but they would play cards in the meantime and see some Fräulein and, and so on, and we're happy. So there, shortly before this village, he put these 400 men down. A terrible noise in the village. People were hellishly frightened. The propaganda always demonizes the enemy, and therefore they had very demonic picture particularly of black soldiers, in spite of the fact that the black soldiers gave all the chocolates to the children and so on. So, and there they were marching there, the tanks, and then the infantry of the right and the left, 
They had their hand in the pocket and their guns were hanging over their shoulder and their cigarette smoking and they thought that was a long day and they were very happy. And there suddenly this general gives the order to shoot. And so 400 people began to shoot. And then he withdrew them all. It was maybe one minute, one minute, two minutes. He withdrew them and went behind the hill. The trick was that what he wanted to show the Americans, German tragedy, uh, German strategy, was that the barrels of the tanks could not lift high enough in order to shoot over the hill. He had estimated the height of the hill and the movements of the barrels of the tanks. And they shot now into the hill. He had no casualty. And what happened to his soldiers? Eight years later, I went to the same inn. It was peace now, and in the meantime, I had married an American woman in Washington, uh, whom we had, uh, we had met at the Catholic University. And so I had to go back to Germany to democratize, and so we lived in Germany, and we went to that inn. And I saw the innkeeper, he was still, still the same innkeeper. I said, do you remember the 18th birthday of your daughter? Of course he remembered it. He said, yes, yes, there were soldiers here, and they lived in my house, and they shot all my cows at night because they thought they were tanks. And so they were all dead. And then I said, what else happened there? Uh, was there some fighting? He said, yes, there was maybe a mile up the street. There was suddenly tremendous gunfire, and then it all stopped. And I said, and then what happened then? He said, well, then they bought the body bags and put them all into my court here in the, in the hotel there. And I said, did you count them? Yes, he said, I counted them. How many? Ninety-three. Ninety-three American soldiers lost their lives in a valley which was of no strategic value whatsoever. They had already bombed Würzburg into the ground and were on the way to Berlin, where they couldn't go because Eisenhower thought Hitler would resist in the Alps. So, but nevertheless, it was just a mopping up, mopping up type of an operation. If you want to see and talk about or think about the sense or nonsense of war, then I could tell you innumerable stories like this, but that was one of the most drastic and horrible ones. These were soldiers, many of them black soldiers from Mississippi. They didn't know exactly or wherever, didn't know where they were, and I think they didn't know exactly why they were where they were. So, and they wanted to live. So, this is as far as the horror of the war is concerned. I did surrender. I was, um, uh, was treated well. Um, throughout my imprisonment, I was treated according to the uh, Geneva Convention. Um, and that may be different from the way we think today. Um, one thing was violated. A prisoner had to be put into an area in which there was the same climate as in his home country. But I was put into Virginia, and it was too hot in Virginia. <laughs> Nevertheless, um, I was in the camp, and uh, there, the first time, I came in contact with the so-called Frankfurt School, or what they call in the movie the Critical Theory of Society, which is different from the traditional theory which we have here, still teach here in the, uh, in the uh, social sciences. So it somehow superseded the traditional theory, and it's called the critical theory of society, and we developed out of this the critical theory of religion. But the first time that I came, of course I grew up close to the institute, but my grandfather was a streetcar conductor, and he drove those critical theorists from the institute to the center of the city, but he did not know them, and they did not know him. And so that was a very anonymous type of a contact. But then the, um, uh, in the camps, the United States had set up, through the influence of Mrs. Roosevelt and through the Frankfurt School people who were at the Columbia University, and then the New School people, that is today the New School University, and they had this glorious idea that not all Germans had been fascists, and that therefore it would make sense to re-democratize Germany, so to bring it back to liberalism, and so there were 25,000 out of 300,000 uh, Germans here in the States, they were re-educated, and I was one of them. And there were 100,000 Italian, uh, they're all from the Africa Corps, um, and they were educated as well. 
So there I was uh, in, in, interrogated, and I was interrogated by Jewish secret service men. And um, they needed no torture whatsoever. One can investigate people without torturing them if one is smart enough and knows enough. So there were cross hearings and there were questions from there and there. So one of my fellows there, comrades, they said, you were in this unit and in January uh, 1943 you were in Lodz, yes, you were a truck driver and you drove trucks. Now on this day there were trucks going to this quarry and you drove this truck, yes, well, and who was on that truck? Well, Jews were on this truck because long before they were gassed to Cyclone B, they were shot massively. When I came to Kiev a few years ago, on the Sunday when the SS had been there, 170 Jews had been shot in, in Kiev on that Sunday already. Then I thought, that's enough, that they didn't do more. No, they didn't do more. There was a quarry near Kiev, and there in this quarry, 35,000 Jews were shot, not gas, shot. So it started already much, much earlier. So um, nevertheless, uh, um, I was uh, um, then, you know, I was surrendered and I was uh, treated well and uh, I had this hearing and they found out that I was uh, an anti-Nazi. Why? Because I had belonged to the Catholic Youth Movement and the Catholic Youth Movement had spread a letter by Cardinal uh, Gar von Galen uh, and, uh, against the camps but also against the Allied situation bombing and we spread his sermons around the city and had been caught by the Gestapo and we also helped some Jews in the basements and kept them and fed them and they were better, they spoke better German than I did, the agents, and they knew Frankfurt better than I did and so that is why I became one of those 25,000 and uh, professors from Harvard and Yale and so on, they <coughs> taught us liberalism and democracy. Um, they had sometimes funny ideas, they thought, they said, if you don't have space enough, build skyscrapers and plant potatoes on top of the skyscrapers. Then you can feed the whole nation and you can house them. So they had sometimes strange ideas, but no less. It was better than Morgenthau, who wanted to castrate everybody and make it into an agricultural territory. So there was a massive improvement, I would say, over this plan. So <clears throat> nevertheless, I was then sent home. Uh, this barbed wire was taken away and I was free in the country and I could study and couldn't run away anyway. Where, where did you want to run? So, Nevertheless, uh, and then I was put on the wrong ship. Um, the, the Liberty ships only went five and a half times over the ocean. Uh, last time and a half time, it was a bad, bad trip. So nevertheless, they had no names and the State Department mixed up the numbers. So the Nazi ships went home to Hamburg and the anti-Nazi ship went to Le Havre and from Le Havre to Bolbeck. And in Bolbeck there was a, a concentration camp, an American concentration camp for SS men. It is possible that sometimes liberals can act like fascists, which does not make them into fascists. Also, that liberals and fascists hate socialists does not make liberals into fascists. If one could be more careful with all these names, I think it would be very helpful. So before we call anybody names, we should know precisely what these concepts mean and uh, if, if they are really fitting the situation. So. Nevertheless, in Bolbeck, I told the, uh, the officer, which played with his dog, very much like an SS officer would have done, uh, I said we were anti-Nazis. Well, he said all Germans were anti-Nazis. And then he took all our uh, uh, cigarettes and, and, and uh, chocolate with which we should go to the black market in Frankfurt because you cannot promote democracy without eating something first. And so uh, he took all that away and I was in this camp for three weeks. When I came into a tent, it was full of water, two SS men, very young, they had all been drafted, um, and uh, they were dead, and um, they didn't tell the commander because they wanted to have their food, and so on. So horrible conditions. Uh, French people came and uh, they looked at us and we were very well fed, and uh, so I, um, I was supposed to work either into a, in a mine or to pick up the mines in the Normandy where the maps were lost. Both were against the Geneva Convention, and when I came to the IJ Farben building, which at that time was the American government, I complained about this, and uh, there have been written books about this in the meantime. So sometimes violations of the Geneva Convention happened. 
Um, and this is a great thing of actuality for us. It will be in the future. There were two uh, events in the Second World War where heads of states wanted to cancel the Geneva Convention as President Bush wanted to do. One was Trayston. When Trayston was bombed four times in the same night, one of the most horrible uh, acts uh, by the British Air Force and in the morning by the American Air Force, then Hitler wanted to cancel the Geneva Convention, which would have meant that thousands of American pilots who were in prison would have been shot. The uh, German generals, it took them three weeks to convince Hitler that this was not a good thing because the Americans and the British would do the same thing with the German prisoners, and he was finally convinced. Uh, Churchill, when the rockets came from Peenemünde under uh, SS Colonel Werner von Braun, who took us to the moon, he was an SS Colonel, uh, he sent these rockets, V number one, V number two, that means vengeance one and vengeance two. Uh, and uh, he was so angry, Churchill, about them that he wanted to gas, would put, put gas into the bombs, which he threw on Germany. And again, the Admiralty <coughs> took him a long time to convince the old man that this was not the right way to do, <coughs> because the rockets would then have also gas in them, and uh, then he would, he would gas all of southern England. <coughs> so, but the hopeful thing in all of this is that conventions can hold. Nobody used gas in the Second World War, <coughs> which harbors gas. And uh, so that is something consoling, that if one makes agreements, let's see, concerning the atomic bomb or whatever, maybe it would hold. Uh, there is a possibility. Okay. So uh, then after I finally, after three weeks, the State Department saw that they had the wrong number. <coughs> and then I was sent home and to Heilbronn and to Frankfurt and I started um, there uh, my democracy work and I got in contact with two very great people. One was uh, um, Kogon, or again Kogon, who wrote the SS State. You probably have it in your library. There is a new edition out of this. And the other one was Walter Dirks, one of the most honest journalists in Europe at that time and up to the day. So I began to work with them. They established the Frankfurt Journal. It was a combination of Catholicism and socialism. That means a Catholic cultural journal on the left. And for some time it had a lot of followers, but then through Adenauer um, there was, uh, it, it uh, lost out. Uh, with the two, I also uh, founded the Christian Democratic Party of Hessen, and um, we wanted to do something. We wanted to bring workers and Christians together, <coughs> and it failed. The Christians did not trust the workers, they were all communists, and the workers didn't trust the Christians because they were all bourgeois. Then came Adenauer, and he put the Catholic and the Protestant uh, Christians together in one party, the Christian Democratic Party, and the workers went all into the socialistic parties again, into the communistic party, which was then repressed. So um, the, uh, I remained in the Christian Democratic Party. It had a left wing, and it, uh, this left wing developed uh, all the social legislation in Germany, and their social security and health insurance, uh, collective health insurance and so on, are still today in, in very good shape. The party itself moved more and more to the right. Merkel now is the uh, chancellor, and uh, so that is a has become more and more a capitalistic uh, uh, party. But it wasn't that way when when I started there. I did all my studies. I studied in Mainz and Münster and so on, and uh, I studied history and theology and philology and so on. And um, then I went a second time to the United States because I was supposed to be uh, again. Uh, um, Know, educated to do the democratization work better and so I studied at Catholic University and met my wife there we went to Germany we started our family and we had eight children and Dustin forgot 14 grandchildren which by the way according to Malthusian laws you know that in the 60s uh, the American corporate class put the working class on the pill for 10 million dollars which they spent for this. And since that time, we have zero population, which means everybody report uses himself once, which means 2.1 children we are allowed to have. This point one there, I don't know where, where that fits, but <laughs> with my children, seven survive, and they have exactly 14 children. 
in spite of the fact that one has no children, the other one has only one child, the other one has two children, the other one has three children, but the mathematics comes out exactly as it ought to be. And this one-to-one, -one, uh, everybody that was used himself once, gives stability to the workforce and to the army, and it is a very desirable type of a goal. So um, that, as far as my family is concerned, they're all blooming, and they are coming to my house, and I have a barbarian invasion with 14 little fellows coming up there, and they're very happy, and sometimes they call me and sing songs to me, so I can be busy all day long with them. So, and then, uh, I've been since 46 years or so, I'm in Western, but I also went to Canada and uh, um, uh, worked there and in Europe and taught there, and as Dustin mentioned, since 35 years in Dubrovnik, even during the Civil War when the Serbs shot at us, in spite of the fact that I bought a lot of money and, and medicine into the Civil War, not only for the Serbs, but for others as well. And at that time, we also, in these places, we developed then with Dustin, too, as you saw, and other of my students, Walter is here, uh, and uh, Steve is here. Uh, we developed this critical theory of religion, and it is spreading, and we have a lot of literature. We do that also with the University of in, in, uh, in uh, Iran, Iran, so we try to, uh, you know, build bridges between the civilizations, as long as people have a discourse, they will not kill each other. If you deny the discourse, if you want to have war, you only have to stop discourse and you have it already. Uh, so we, uh, instead of the collision of the civilizations, we rather uh, want to, uh, uh, to have a discourse among the uh, civilizations or nations. And if you think that a discourse is a very weak thing, it's a very weak thing. But the alternative to discourse is always war and we are now in three of them. So um, that, uh, uh, you know, that is the work which we have done and we have uh, written, all of us, my students as well, um, we have written articles and books in this attempt. For us, this course is future-oriented remembrance of human suffering with the practical intent to diminish this suffering. Uh, so that was our plan and uh, we did what we could our, under our circumstances. Now. In this work, we have three types, and that I want to conclude with this, uh, the three types of uh, futures which we uh, try to aim at, or which we think that trends in our present civil society move in this direction. One trend goes to a, to a completely uh, administered society, to a completely bureaucratized society, completely computerized society, and we can see, li say, see daily trends which go in this direction. Another one is the military, militaristic society, the future number two, and um, uh, there we also see tendencies, if you see of our military budget, you know that one rocket, we have sent a lot of rockets already into Libya, one rocket alone is one million dollars. If you send 10, which is almost nothing, then you have already 10 million dollars. I think we spent the first week one billion dollars. So um, that uh, you can see from the budget that there is a strong trend to further militarization. And then we have the third one, and that is what we call the reconciled society. <coughs> Our the civil society in which we live now has many uh, contradictions and antagonisms, and one which we are concerned in religion is that between the religious and the secular. Since about 400 years, the West and the West alone has transformed the difference between the sacred and the profane into an antagonism between the two from Copernicus and Galileo to Darwin to uh, Marx and Freud and so on, we have become more and more secular. Sometimes we would like to console ourselves and think, you know, that maybe religion is coming back or so, but when you look at our legislation, you will see that it gets more and more profane in a certain sense. So we have now six states which have uh, um, uh, homosexual uh, marriages, if you want to call it that way, um, uh, which is against all three Abrahamic religions. So, um, and that was already when we introduced divorce, that was against uh, the New Testament and so on. So, um, we, uh, uh, religions try to reinterpret and to accommodate, but uh, this reinterpretation has its limits. So, therefore, we do have that problem, but we have a glass problem. Um, and very often we cover it up by our race problem, but it is really a class problem. 
is the most painful of all of them, that the rich get always richer and the poor get always poorer. And, um, and you see many indications. Uh, we have a working for workforce of uh, uh, 200 million people and uh, what we call the middle class, and when we say the labor unions have created the middle class, we mean well-paid workers in Ford Motor Company and so on. But exactly there where the unions were most successful in these states are now those who suffer most because they made the, the workers too expensive and therefore in search of cheap labor and so on, the car industry went to Mississippi and then they go to Central America and then they go to China and to India and so on. So one cannot simply say you have to stay here. You cannot simply say, General Motors, you make enough profit here. You don't have to go to Mississippi because the the pressure is that you have to increase profit, uh, profit all the time and that you do that by competing. So you have Jap Japanese firms over there and here um, who are looking for cheap labor too. And so therefore the, uh, the ruling class here, the corporate class, is under compulsion. So if we get angry against our president, done at Western uh, because of cuts or whatever, he will tell us to go to the governor. And then the governor will tell us to go to Detroit, to the ruling coup, that they don't send enough uh, uh, money to the, to the state coffers and so on. Uh, so and if we would ask them, they would say, dear man, you know, I would like to uh, not to fire people or whatever, but there are these damn Germans, you know, and they compete in the damn Japanese too. So, and we have to not only stay on the same level, but we have to increase the profit and if we don't do that, then the whole system will crash. So <clears throat> that, that is why we are in a very, very difficult situation, I think. And uh, the, uh, George Soros, who pays my Eastern students in Dubrovnik and Yalta, um, he is a billionaire, uh, rich from currency exchange uh, profits. He pulled $8, million, eight billion dollars out of Indonesia few years ago and the whole economy collapsed up to Tokyo. That one man, you know, can decide uh, what the fate of a whole country or a whole continent is, is something uh, extraordinary. But this uh, uh, George Soros uh, would say that the regulations have to be increased, that the power of the state has to be increased. He knows that civil society, if it's led to itself and is privatized and so on, it will commit suicide, as we have seen when in the last days of President Bush, when they came and said, Mr. President, the economy goes over the brink. But what Obama has done so far, in terms of that experience, which I told you before, what he has done, he, is, uh, he, has, uh, he has somehow federalized the obligations of the banks, but he has not federalized the banks. And wherever he, uh, uh, you know, because he does not, not because he is not a wonderful person or so, but because he does not have the power behind him, uh, even in his own party, to do this federalization, there will be another president, not too long for now, and somebody will come and will say, Mr. President, the economy goes over the brink, and then we will not get another trillion or whatever from, from the communist China, and we will not have the same amount of money in the federal government in order to do that federalization and then we will have an increase of the unemployment in Detroit and, and, and so on, and the cities will become restless and we will ask for the emergency laws and that will, of course, point in the same direction with which I started today. When a liberal society gets in trouble into military crisis or economic crisis, then socialists are coming up and they say, oh, when Obama is a socialist, which he is not, he is also a liberal. And, uh, and then when the socialists are coming up, then the power elite will call the fascists in and in order to repress them and to restabilize civil society. And this is a fateful type of a thing. And I think from the experiences which I told you, um, we can find maybe a better solution than the Germans did. It would be a horrible type of development for this country if we would go the German way and others do. You know, El Salvador uh, is a fascist country under the Urina party. That is where Bishop Romero has been killed. That where 72,000 people have been killed who belong to the uh, Christian basic communities and so on. And why have they been killed? 
because these priests, these liberation theologians, tell the people that they have dignity and that their God is with them and that they should organize. And when they organize, they bring the wages up. And when they bring the wages up, they bring the profits down. And when they bring the profits down, then the northern capitalists don't have any reason anymore to go there in order to get cheaper labor. And therefore, we have the School of the Americas, and the School of the Americas is where we train our terrorists. And they go into those villages and shoot, shoot for people in order to frighten them so that they will not organize and will not bring their wages up and will not bring the profits down. We cannot talk about all these things without talking about our economic system and what we want to do with it because it, it's dynamic. If you say yes to it, there are all kinds of iron consequences which that has. And what we should have is a discourse among each other if we want to pay the price, the enormous price, in order to keep this system which we have going. <laughs> we are used to it, our dreams are connected to it, I know. It is very difficult. But so it was for the Germans and for the Italians and so on. So um, therefore, I hope and want to end up with this idea of discourse, that we can have town hall meetings or national discourse of what we want to do with our economy. Thank you for being here. Can you hear me at all? We have a little bit of time for um, questions. We have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, we went over a little bit over than what we were planning, but um, it's a great honor to have Dr. Siebert here, so I figured that uh, it was definitely worth that little extra time. Uh, so if you're okay with that, Rudy, we yes, can take yeah. a few Go questions. Ahead. So if anyone has any questions, you just had to be kind of loud because the microphone's not working. Either that or just operator deficiency. So, anything? Yes, Josh. Uh, how do you feel about Say that again, the first part. Stauffenberg. How do you feel about Stauffenberg's attempt to kill Oh, yeah, right. I mean, this came, of course, very late. Stauffenberg, Colonel Stauffenberg, you know, had fought in the East, of course. He had lost his arm. So uh, he was part of the whole effort, first of all. But then there was a group, you know, which uh, thought something had to be done about it and, uh, very late. He was a Catholic. And so he went to confession and asked if he could assassinate Hitler because, uh, and, and the priests all said in the confessional, you cannot kill Hitler, you cannot kill anybody. Uh, but then he met a Jesuit in the confessional, and the confession and the Jesuit followed the natural law teaching, and there was a teaching in the Middle Ages of tyrannicide. That means if a nation's life is, uh, is uh, threatened by its government, the people have a right to take the government out and to uh, assass assassin, if possible. So then he went and he did this, but uh, he was not a very good engineer. Uh, he went to the toilet. He sharpened only half of the of the uh, explosives. Um, uh, the, the room was changed. It was not the bunker in the Wolfschanze in East Prussia. Uh, Hitler had two headquarters: the one in Kiev, near Kiev, and one in the Wolfschanze. And so they had gone into a room which was open, the windows, and so the blast, you know, went out the window, and so the whole thing failed. And uh, and then uh, when you go, you can go to Berlin now, in the for former home of the, uh, of the army there, and uh, there is a monument where he was shot then. So um, if um, they wanted, their plan was that they wanted to make peace with the Western allies in order to get a free hand in Russia. And it would have been a bourgeois government uh, in, uh, in Berlin then to replace Hitler. Um, now, uh, they were all conservative people, right? So nobody from the working class was involved. The great disappointment is the working class, which uh, was persuaded by Hitler to march with him. There were maybe 12% maybe of the working class was on his side, really fanatically. 12% were against it, mostly communists, and uh, who would make jokes about Hitler or worse things like sabotage and so on. But the broad middle range of the workers was silent, but they in, were therefore let him do whatever 
he wanted to do and said Heil, Heil, Heil and so on. So um, in the First World War the workers did rise in the end and made revolutions in Hamburg and in Munich and then in St. Petersburg and Moscow and so on. But um, the Hitler had, had taken them under control, he had misled them, uh, he talked revolutionary language but he said, I'm the most conservative revolutionary ever, and, uh, but he was not a conservative revolutionary, he was a counter-revolutionary. Um, there had been three attacks against the Soviet Union. At Lenin's time, 12 capitalist armies marched in, and uh, then Hitler was the second one. The third one was 1989, which was a very successful uh, neoliberal counter-revolution, which brought the communism down to some extent there. Hitler almost brought it down, but it ended in Kursk and in, in Stalingrad and so on. So in the first one, there are still 8,000 Americans in Murmansk buried there because we participate in this. So we have three counter-revolutionary movements against the Soviet Union, and the last one was the most effective one and the most unbloody one. So therefore, Stauffenberg you know, belonged to the nobility. So it was the bourgeoisie and the nobility which did the attack against Hitler. It was not the working class, um, but it was too late. Any other questions? Yes. Have you ever felt any bias being an uh, allied nation out of the war? A bias, you mean personally? Yeah, like anyone uh, ever really had some kind of hostility towards you? No, nobody did. And, um, the, uh, not even in the Soviet Union. So I, I taught in, uh, you know, in Eastern European countries as well, and it is uh, somehow miraculous um, because if you see in Croatia, for instance, uh, the Germans, you know, punished for partisans in one town, they killed the whole high school with the teachers, and one should think, you know, that people would forever hate people who speak that language and, and so on.